Indian economy has emerged as a strong economy post the COVID crisis. Thanks to the jugalbandi between Reserve Bank of India and the government, Indian economy on a relative basis and also on absolute basis now clearly is on a pedestal positioning. But the challenges of yesterday are different and the challenges of today are in a sense centered around inflation, geopolitical crisis and a high interest rate regime. So to understand what is the way forward for interest rates, economy, growth, the war against inflation, it's my honor and a channel's privilege to have the Governor of Reserve Bank of India on ET now. Governor, it's an honor to have you on ET now. Thank you. My introduction, I guess, was an acknowledgement of the great work RBI has done under your leadership. We clearly have emerged on the pedestal post the COVID crisis. But the elephant in the room, Governor, is inflation. Has RBI won the war against inflation? Uh, well, thank you for uh, having me on your channel. And uh, uh, at the outset, uh, I also would like to wish uh, warm good morning to all your viewers and namaskar. Now, so far as inflation is concerned, I think it is getting increasingly anchored. We reached a peak in seven po at 7.8 percent and thereafter the inflation has moderated in the subsequent three prints. The latest was 6.7 percent. And the inflation, why I am saying inflation and inflation expectations more, you know, are also getting anchored is because if you see, you know, the all around the way the various analysts and uh, the market participants are looking at the economy. We do a survey of professional, uh, you know, forecasters. We do a survey of investors. We do a consumer household survey. I mean, we do a consumer survey and a household survey. Now, all the indications, all the, you know, the survey results are pointing uh, to the fact that inflation is, uh, expectations around inflation are getting anchored. And the bond yields also are, uh, especially at the long end, they are also reflecting the fact that inflation is getting anchored. Now, for example, if you look at uh, the 10-year uh, GSEC, now the 10-year GSEC, uh, before we started, uh, before the, you know, the May uh, meeting of the MPC, when we started uh, the current rate hike cycle by 40 basis points, just before that it was around 7.1, 7.12. And today it's about 7.28. Uh, today morning I had seen it was 7.3. Now, so therefore, the, you know, bond yields, especially at the long end, how they behave, that also is a reflective of, that is also reflective of whether inflation expectations are getting anchored. But I must also recognize that there are other important factors which are playing a role. For example, the softening of uh, the crude prices, softening of certain commodity prices, and uh, then, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, the sort of the appreciation or the depreciation of the U.S. dollar. U.S. Uh, dollar, you know, the D Dixie, yes. after reaching about 105, 106, it had moderated to about 104. Now it is again, it seems to be going back. So there are so many factors which are at play. But coming back to your question, I think, uh, as I have said in the monetary policy statement, uh, I think at this point of time, according to our assessment, inflation has uh, peaked and it is expected to moderate going forward. Inflation expectations are get also getting well anchored, but we have to be, I mean, there's absolutely no room for any complacency. Inflation, consumer inflation is still at 6.7%, uh, and we need to bring it down, as I have said in my minutes, first below 6%, and then move closer to, you know, the target rate of 4%. And uh, so, therefore, and with so many uncertainties, we, you yourself mentioned about the geopolitical, uh, you know, developments, the spillovers, how the dollar appreciation is going to happen, how the advanced economies, which are facing, in fact, bigger problems of inflation, there are 10 percent. UK is 10 percent. US has moderated to about 8.5 or 8.7 percent. Advanced economies, Eurozone is also facing the problem of high inflation. So how they are also going to adjust the rates and what spillovers it will, you know, it will have on the financial markets. I think there are several uncertainties, but just to repeat myself, inflation 
is moderating, expectations are getting anchored and I think our macroeconomic fundamentals and the financial sector stability, they remain quite uh, resilient. I think that was a pretty long <laughs> answer, but I thought let me, you know, put things all in uh, perspective. Since you're a cricket fan, so I'm tempted to frame my next question around that. So can I say that oh. Reserve Bank of India in cricket terminology is no longer fighting with inflation on the front foot, you've come on the back foot? No, no, we always uh, like to, you know, choose the sort. Uh, to, you know, we always like to sort of our approach is to choose the shot. Uh, depending on the, you know, depending on uh, each ball. I mean, the, in cricket, you know, sometimes you have to play front foot, sometimes you have to play back foot. But by and large, in the last uh, two and a half, three years, ever since the pandemic began, we have been playing in the front foot. And I think even at the time, current moment, we will play in the front foot. But when it is necessary, we will uh, step back and leave, leave out one or two balls and maybe go for a slight, uh, you know, a late cut. So, if I have to get your definition of interest rates now, you've tightened and that was in T20 style. Now, going forward, interest rate hike, will it, be, will, it, will it be a function of test match play? The T20 rate hiking cycle is behind us? Well, I will not be <laughs> able to give you a forward guidance. I think that's a, you know, very, uh, you have put it very nicely. I mean, uh, my compliments to you for putting it very nicely, but I will not be able to give uh, forward guidance about our future rate actions. And uh, people say that, you know, you said that we played a T20 game. Now, if you actually look at it, it was, you know, our, our approach has been fairly steady. It's not as if in May we cut the rates, I mean, sorry, we increased the rates by uh, 40 basis points, then 50, then 50, you know, in three yes. uh, installments we have done it. But look back what we did before uh, May. In April, we introduced the SDF in lieu of the, you know, not in lieu, but uh, the liquidity absorption, the main Starting instrument was the SDF. And that was at a 40 basis points higher than the uh, reverse repo rate. So that led to, a, led to an increase, a synergized, a synchronous increase in the liquidity absorption rate. The overnight call rates went up by about 40 basis points or so. Before that, you know, we have been slowly and steadily pulling out the liquidity through the VR auctions, the variable rate reverse repo auctions. We have been uh, pulling out uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, liquidity even before that. So we were sort of, uh, you know, playing. Sometimes what happens is, you know, there are certain cricketers, since <laughs> you have used the analogy of cricket, let me say that uh, I remember in the 70s when uh, Gavaskar, Sunil Gavaskar was at his peak, you think that he is playing a very slow game, but suddenly you find that he has scored a century. Yes. So sometimes, you know, actions are taken rather silently, but they are not visible. So therefore, you know, you have to really over a time horizon, if you see, the Reserve Bank has been acting steadily, but when because of this sudden development of the war in Ukraine, when suddenly the oil prices, the crude oil prices touched 130, then came down to about 120 and remain thereabouts and uh, commodity price markets were hit uh, the edible oil supplies were hit fertilizer prices went up now this there was a sudden spike in inflation now that sudden spike in inflation required that we increase the pace of scoring the runs but we have been playing quite steadily and going forward i think uh, the incoming you know the incoming data and the uh, where the situation unfolds, as I describe the inflation growth dynamics, how it, uh, you know, the dynamics of inflation and growth, how it plays out, that will determine our uh, future action. Beyond that, it is very difficult and it's not desirable also to give a forward guidance that we will stop or we will increase more or we will increase less because, you see, it creates unnecessary expectations. And you may not, uh, you know, do what you are saying today because the situation is so dynamic and so uncertain. So, Governor, for Reserve Bank of India, during policy making, what weightage would you assign to local cues, local factors, and how much weightage would you assign to global factors? You see, our monetary policy, let me reiterate once again, are primarily determined by domestic factors. Global factors are important in so far as they impact the domestic uh, situation. 
I mentioned about the war in Ukraine, Ukraine. I mentioned about commodity prices going up, the crude oil prices going up, because they impact our you know, domestic uh, inflation. So therefore, we are primarily governed, we are primarily sort of influenced by our domestic situation. And of course, in the, it's a globalized world where uh, we are impacted by what's happening all around us. And naturally, we evaluate how each development is going to impact us and then prepare ourselves. Governor, there seems to be a departure in the way how RBI now is much more nimble. When you have to open the flood gate of liquidity post-COVID crisis, Reserve Bank of India went all out. Everybody feels that you, you are behind the curve, but our channel view is the Reserve Bank of India is not behind the curve in terms of interest rate hike. My question is that, is there a departure at RBI in terms of being much more nimble, much more dynamic? No, whether there is a departure, it's for people like you to judge. But I think as an institution, uh, there is a great amount of consistency in the overall approach of uh, the Reserve Bank in the sense that the focus of Reserve Bank has always been, uh, the overarching focus of Reserve Bank has always been maintaining a financial stability. You look back at any point of time, you know, starting, let's go back to the early 1990s, you know, when the economic reforms started or around the year, uh, you know, the Asian currency crisis and thereafter. I think all actions of Reserve Bank uh, have been uh, sort of uh, consistent in the sense that the focus has always been on financial stability. But specifically to address your point, we are nimble because we had to be nimble because the situation warranted that. The COVID came, COVID pandemic, the virus came, all of a sudden nobody was prepared for, uh, you know, this kind of a shock to the global economy. Suddenly countries around the world went for lockdown and you had to act and you had to act quickly and effectively. Now, just as when things were beginning to look, uh, you know, were coming under control on the COVID front, thanks to our massive uh, vaccination drive and, uh, you know, the other measures taken. And also the financial sector was also, it held on very well. And I must also mention that uh, the financial sector uh, held itself on very well because uh, of, you know, because of several actions which the Reserve Bank has taken. Then you had uh, the problem of the war in uh, uh, Europe, the Ukraine war, and that was also a sudden development. And uh, 24th, before 24th February, nobody had expected a war of this magnitude yes. to happen and to last so long. Naturally, it has produced impact. So over the last three years, the situation demanded that we had to act, ed, we had to act in a very nimble manner. I remember when COVID, uh, you know, the COVID uh, uh, in the initial days, around uh, March uh, 28th or so. I mean, the incoming uh, news was very disturbing. So therefore, even before the lockdown was announced yes. in India, we had put together in the Reserve Bank, within a matter of four or five days, we put up that, uh, you know, the quarantine facility yes, yes, and all our market operations were mm -hmm. undertaken from that quarantine facility outskirts of Mumbai. So we were trying to be as proactive as possible. And I think the lockdown was announced on 25th uh, of yeah. March, uh, March, 25th March 2020, yeah. the first lockdown. Yes, yes. And uh, we made, a, on behalf of the RBI, I made those announcements on 27th mm -hmm. of March. Similarly, when the war started, uh, we were watchful. And in April, we took a number of actions other than a rate hike, which I think the market was uh, <laughs> expecting or there were some of them were even expecting. No, market was not expecting, but I think some analysts were expecting. Uh, but uh, effectively, we took uh, several actions on uh, 6th of April, uh, you know, including the introduction of the SDF. Then we, uh, you know, several other measures we announced. We changed our priority, uh, the sequence of our priorities, you know, from growth yes. and inflation to inflation and growth. So therefore, we have tried to be nimble as possible because we are as nimble as possible because we are living in a very dynamic world. And, uh, you know, we are living in a dynamic world. And uh, unless the central bank also becomes a dynamic uh, organization in terms of actions as necessary, yeah. it cannot be action for the sake of action, but actions as necessary, I think it's, uh, you know, 
we have to be in tune of with the times and also we have to anticipate emerging developments and you know always remain in uh, uh, sync with uh, the times today i think the debate around whether rbi is behind the curve i think that debate hopefully has ended and i am happy that your uh, channel you say has uh, been of the view that we are not behind the curve so thank you for that <laughs> at least for you know uh, perhaps uh, you know sort of appreciating not perhaps i mean anyway <laughs> let me leave it at that okay. governor we in your mpc briefings and at various public forums you often refer to the us fed the interest rate trajectory which they followed so we know your thoughts on us economy and the interest rate curve they are following but the elephant in the room sir according to us is china how closely are you monitoring china big economy it's going in a different way and it is something which will have an impact on how things would move now going forward you see us i refer to because you know there are several federal governors one statement comes out from one governor saying that uh, you know that particular governor believes that there should be you know tighter uh, there should be bigger rate hikes after 2 3 days there is another observation now they do influence the market now friday the us fed chief is going to give a, a speech jackson at hole. Uh, jackson hole yes. and you see the kind yes. of uh, you know expectations that are building up i mean there is one school which are expecting that perhaps he will give a hawkish message the other school believes that he will not be as hawkish what is your personal thoughts frankly i don't know and i would not like okay. to i would not like to prejudge him because uh, they are also facing the kind of uncertain uh, situation as we are uh, facing and uh, but coming to you know our uh, bigger uh, neighbor that is china you are mm -hmm. referring to uh, yes we are watchful of uh, all the data of, it is the second largest uh, economy and uh, we are watchful of the data coming from china and how it will impact our domestic uh, economy uh, in terms of uh, domestic manufacturing in terms of uh, you know the um, uh, in you know if chinese growth slows down what impact it will produce on global growth all these things we do monitor uh, very closely we monitor the global developments and as a part of the global developments we do monitor the happenings in all large economies like uh, the us the eurozone china japan uh, we also i mean do monitor uh, what is happening in africa now in all this global debate we don't hear of any mention of uh, africa i mean it's a huge yeah. continent yeah. and uh, we have to see also what is happening there so we monitor on the global scale all the large economies but at the same time we don't leave out any area you know which may not look very important but tomorrow if there is a food crisis in uh, let's say in parts of africa naturally it will impact uh, the global uh, you know the global uh, cereal prices for example uh, you know like when uh, the wheat from black sea region when the supplies stopped uh, suddenly there was a decline in the supplies naturally the food prices the cereal prices went up in africa and all over the world so therefore as a part of our global monitoring we do monitor china japan eurozone us all these countries governor I'd like to draw your attention to perhaps something which is very relevant and that is the trade deficit and the cd trade deficit at a record high cd at an alarming high level if i look at the lay of the world there is a slowdown we can debate whether it is soft landing or hard landing sir but there is a slowdown which will impact exports which will impact global fdi flows into india even portfolio flows into india how are you planning to address that you see i according according to our assessment the cad will be within manageable levels on crude oil prices today morning of course there has been a little bit of movement on crude oil prices they have slightly hardened but crude oil prices now there are many experts uh, internationally who are uh, taking a position that uh, the crude oil uh, price will be below 100 uh, dollars per barrel this was not uh, in the realm of uh, anybody's thinking uh, a couple of months ago uh, there are institutions which are projecting 95 dollar per barrel we have in the reserve bank in the mpc we have assumed 105 dollars as the average price for the tier so therefore uh, according to our assessment cad current account deficit will be within manageable levels and we will be able to finance it in a very in a reasonably comfortable manner and i'll just take uh, 
just a couple of minutes to explain why. The exports, Indian exports have picked up and they, they are expected to do well in the coming months also. The, in, uh, the exports in July came down, mainly that was confined to one particular sector, petroleum and petroleum products. Now the export tax has also been adjusted, has been you know, reduced uh, to some extent. And uh, the expectation is that petroleum product exports will pick up and will do better in August. Yeah. But we have to wait till the end of the month to see the results. In the last two, three years, India has also entered uh, new markets in terms of exports. India has also entered with, uh, you know, uh, products. I mean, the India's share in the total global trade or rather the volume of our exports in certain items have also gone up over the last uh, uh, two, three years. The PLI scheme has also helped. And uh, as, uh, you know, we are uh, sort of... Uh, uh, as uh, you know, let us say if there is a large economy which is uh, slowing down, if indeed uh, European continent is moving towards uh, some people say recession, I, we have to see. But for a slowdown in growth, there will be a contraction in export demand. But when there is a contraction in export demand at the same time, the global supply chain is so disrupted. It is also opening up new opportunities for uh, Indian players to get into the global value chain. And I think uh, many of our exporters and manufacturers and service sector players have been able to, you know, get into that, uh, are getting into that global value chain in a, in a bigger way than what they were, let's say, three or uh, four years or five years ago. So therefore, and coming to financing of uh, the, uh, you know, the current account deficit, now the uh, portfolio flows, which were, you know, it was only outflow till the end of uh, uh, June. We are now see there were uh, positive, you know, net inflows in the month of July. And August, from, you know, from 1st August till now, there have been consistently there are inflows uh, which are coming in. And uh, that is expected to sustain. And as, uh, uh, you know, as I think uh, we were having a conversation before this interview began. I think uh, internationally, globally also, uh, international investors are looking at India with greater uh, optimism. Just imagine we have, I said this somewhere this. earlier also, the country has witnessed two major shocks, two black swan events for the entire world, COVID-19 pandemic and the what? war in Europe. Despite these two huge shocks, our macroeconomic fundamentals remain resilient. Our financial stability is also maintained. And growth we are expecting around, you know, according to our projections, it is 7.2% and inflation is moderating. Capital inflows are... So there is financial stability, there is macroeconomic stability, and the country has withstood it. Not many countries around the world have uh, done it. So therefore, I think there is greater uh, investor interest in India. FDI has done, uh, you know, compared to last year, FDI has done slightly better. I think I gave the figure in the last MPC. It's about 13.6 uh, uh, billion uh, this year from 1st April compared to 11.6 uh, billion in the previous year. So therefore, I think all in all, current account deficit should be within manageable levels. That is our assessment. And we will be in a comfort, you know, reasonably comfortable position to finance our uh, current account deficit. So, Governor, if I put two and two together, which is your assumption that crude will stay above $100, crude is now below $100, inflation has peaked out, MPC has already spoken about inflation coming down to 5% in the first quarter of the coming financial year. So, if I say that eventually the glide path for inflation somewhere in FY24 would be 4%, would that be a stretched assessment on my behalf? Yeah, you know, we have also said, uh, you know, this earlier. I have said it, and I think my colleagues in RBI have also said it. That, and we said this about yeah. uh, four or five months ago, uh, that we would like to bring down inflation over a, you know, over a, uh, over a time cycle, over a, you know, cycle of about, uh, uh, about two years or so. So therefore, if you say 24, I think by and large, uh, uh, I think what you say may play out accordingly, 
and our you look at the projections which M, we have given in the last MPC, uh, it's uh, five percent in the you know in the first quarter of next year, five point eight in the last quarter of this year, five percent in the first quarter of yes. this year, and thereafter it tends to moderate. But in between, there will be the effect of base. You know, the, the base effect will sometimes work favorably, sometimes it may not work that favorably, I mean it may be unfavorable. But by and large, I think we are moving closer to 4% in a steady manner without, uh, you know, without uh, much of uh, growth sacrifice. Governor, now Reserve Bank of India has always maintained that we are not worried about the real level of rupee, we want to trim the volatility out. Can you define volatility for us? Because each time press has asked you a question on rupee, you said, look, we are here to make the rupee stable, not volatile. What is your definition of volatility? Nobody's asked you this question before, so I'm tempted to ask you this. No, I will come <laughs> to that. But before that, let me also supplement, uh, you know, just by, yes. let me also slightly, you know, I would like to slightly supplement my previous answer. So with all this, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, about yes. uh, sort of uh, current account deficit. Yeah. I mentioned about mm -hmm. uh, inflation coming under control over a two-year cycle. But then, there is no room for complacency. I said this earlier. We are very watchful. We monitor each and every small incoming data. And given the kind of uncertainties will, uh, which prevail, we have to remain watchful. And uh, there cannot be a let up in that. So I just want to qualify. You're on the front foot, sir. We understand uh, that. Uh, I just <laughs> want to say that uh, it's not as if uh, you know the war is over. The war in <laughs> Europe is very much on. Yes. COVID has not ended. Yes. Even the United States yes. is reporting more than yes. a lakh uh, yes. cases per yes. day. Yes. So we have to remain watchful. Now coming to what is our definition of uh, volatility, many things are not uh, possible to define in the classical uh, terms. But it's a concept. Volatility means wild uh, movements. Uh, and uh, we prevent, uh, we try to prevent uh, volatility, check volatility in both directions. When the rupee is appreciating and when the rupee is depreciating. Now, in the last two years, there was considerable amount of uh, inflows, you know, forex inflows yes. coming into India. Now, we did not allow the, I mean, we sort of prevented, we sort of started uh, accumulating reserves at that time because we knew that the cycle will turn and there will be a time when there will be an outflow of dollars. We have seen it in the past, so we have learned from past experience. So when the inflows were strong, we started picking up the dollars to build up our buffers. That was the first objective. The second objective is that we know that the wheel will turn. So therefore, if you let the rupee appreciate so much, then the wheel turns, then the fall will be very steep. So therefore, we like a more orderly evolution of the rupee exchange rate in both directions, when it is appreciating as well as when it is depreciating, basically to check the volatility, to check wild movements uh, within a very short period. It should be a gradual movement. But Governor, to do any inflation forecasting without a rupee level in mind is always going to be tough. So Reserve Bank of India will have to work with a band which they feel is the right band for rupee. You see, uh, we do factor in, I mean, uh, in any case, uh, uh, the eventual exchange rate of the rupee vis-a-vis -vis -vis the dollar, it's a function of the market. And we do analyze that, how the rupee is going to, you know, how the exchange rate is going to evolve during the current year in the next six months and in the next uh, one year. And in the monetary policy report, which we bring out uh, twice a year, we do give out that number, uh, the level at, you know, what is our assessment, uh, at what rate uh, rupee to a dollar what is the rate we have assumed for our calculations. So we give out, uh, give it out once in six months and there is a reason for that also. You know, because if you give out rates every time then sometimes, you know, it can be, it can create, uh, you know, it can create very uh, distorted expectations in the market also. Governor, while credit growth is back, deposit growth is lagging credit growth. You've appealed to banks last time in terms of what kind of lending they should do. But is there something which needs to be done immediately? Because as when we speak to even SBI, on a large base they are talking about a 13-14% credit growth. 
uh, and deposit growth is nowhere close to that. Could that create a mismatch which Reserve Bank of India now needs to address? Now, what I said in the last MPC, I would just like to repeat that uh, when credit growth, I mean the overall credit growth uh, now the, according to the latest uh, data, it's 14.5% the credit growth that was on as on 29th uh, July year on year. So to sustain a 14.5% uh, credit growth, you need uh, capital. Thanks to you know our uh, working very closely with the banks and nudging the banks, I think almost all banks, both public and private sector banks have raised capital. You also need, as you have very rightly pointed out, funding resources coming from deposits. Yeah. Now, what I said in the last MPC, and I would like to reiterate that again, is that uh, the banks will be, you know, will have to, if they have to, you know, achieve a credit growth of 13, 14, or 14 and a half, or 15 percent, they have to raise resources by way of increasing the deposit rates. And it's beginning to happen. It has happened. In fact, you see now very often, very every now and then, some bank or the other, you know, adjusting their MCLR, increasing their uh, uh, deposit rates today morning also I saw I mean last evening last uh, yesterday some banks have raised their rates they have introduced new deposit schemes at slightly higher rates because banks will have to raise uh, their funding you know the deposit rates so as to meet their credit requirements so it will happen the credit growth is a little below 9 percent at the moment it's about 8.7 percent or so I think going forward it should uh, pick up since the government has a very big uh, borrowing target and in a sense you are the banker of the government to raise a bond from the bond market, when bond yields in April and June, when they were almost threatening to go at 8%, did the Reserve Bank of India intervene or you are okay with where the bond yields are right now? You know, the bond yields, uh, I think uh, middle of June, it touched about 7.6 or 7.6, 7 7 7 okay. I'm talking about the 10 year. Okay. Uh, the benchmark 10-year uh, paper, mm -hmm. it touched about 7.62. Thereafter, it has uh, moderated. So at the moment, I think the bond market uh, remains uh, steady. I think, as I mentioned a little while ago, uh, inflation expectations have, uh, you know, have moderated. Inflation is actually moderating. And uh, so at the moment, uh, the bond market is uh, functioning in a very orderly manner. We come in if we see some disorderly, uh, you know, uh, developments or, uh, you know, uh, some amount of disorder, disorder or uh, disruption in the market due to various reasons. Did you notice that in uh, April and May? No, it was for a few days. I mean, there is no room for uh, a knee-jerk reaction by the seeing the development just two or three days. We have to see, watch the situation and then uh, act. But RBI intervenes only if it is necessary and uh, developments over a period of just a few days, uh, I mean that cannot be the determinant factor for taking action. You have called crypto dangerous, you have used the word that it could create instability in the financial sector, but that was a comment when crypto price levels were very different, that was a time when the broad participation was very different. Things have changed at the price point and also at the participation level. What are your thoughts on crypto now? No, I think uh, I'm happy that we sounded those uh, warning signals. And I would like to believe that a uh, large number of people would have uh, taken note of uh, the warning signals and the concerns expressed by the Reserve Bank. And I, am, I would like to believe, and anecdotally I'm aware, we are aware that uh, anecdotally that many people did not uh, you know, invest in crypto or they sort of pulled out of crypto. Uh, thanks to the you know the caution and the you know the kind of caution that uh, and the concerns that emanated uh, or that came out uh, that went out of the uh, reserve bank and uh, the crypto you know it we have said it earlier it can create a lot of financial instability in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the ability of uh, the central bank to you know, determine monetary policy, it will upset. Uh, it will also upset. It will also have adverse impact on our exchange rate, on capital flows, on banking sector stability, and you know, potential for being used as uh, a tool for uh, money laundering and for illicit uh, transfer of money, and also it can uh, you know lead to 
you know, it will, I mean, knowing fully well something which does not have any underlying and in fact, I said that uh, at one point I said that it does not have any underlying not even a tulip. Now, something which does not have any underlying the prices will not remain high all the time. So, therefore, it, when it may crash and it has crashed. So, ultimately in a situation like this, it is the small investors who lose money. So, therefore, it is a big risk for the small investors also. And uh, the technology has got various uh, applications, the blockchain, DLT or whatever you call it. The technology has got many applications. The benefits of the technology need to be capitalized. They are being already capitalized. The technology is nothing new. And uh, so, therefore, uh, we flag those concerns. And you know, in this countries like India, we are differently placed from advanced uh, economies. When there is a talk of dollarization of economy, if I am, uh, uh, you know, sitting at the other end of the globe, if I am in the US, I will be very happy. But if I am in India, I would not be happy, whether as an individual or as a central banker. It is not a good thing for our economy to happen. So, therefore, emerging market economies, particularly all since all the cryptos are denominated in uh, you know the dollar. hard currencies by and large mm -hmm. dollar, it will not uh, work in favor of countries like India. It may work in favor of uh, countries like you know the bigger economies, the advanced economies. Mm -hmm. Governor, uh, there seems to be a feeling that fintech in India will be more and more regulated. And for a sector which in a sense gets the innovation value to a country like India, which is creating job, which is taking the financial sector to a different level, why is there a perception that Reserve Bank of India wants to regulate the fintech more? You see, fintech, we are in fact encouraging a fintech. We have set up an innovation hub in Bangalore. We have, you look at the large number of steps that we have taken and the latest, uh, you know, the digital lending, uh, you know, the regulatory framework which we have come out. It is largely supportive of the fintech sector. If you allow a new thing to, you know, we have to see any new, in any innovation, what kind of risks it is bringing into the economy. And those risks will have to be mitigated. Unless the regulator acts, you know, you will have uncontrolled risks developing. I will give you a very uh, simple, commonplace uh, example. Every innovation has value. Let us say, you know, I am an innovator and uh, I innovate a high speed car. And I feel that keep my innovation, you know, this car is the best, you know, it is the best thing that has happened. And yes, it is definitely a very good innovation. We appreciate that. But I have to drive that car in the roads of Mumbai or in the roads of any Indian city or in the Indian. Now, I cannot say that, ki, look, I will drive at 200 kilometers uh, at speed. Forget about the pedestrian, forget about the other tra traffic, for forget about the speed breakers, forget about rest of the road. So, the speed of my car has to be regulated. So, it is precisely that. So, therefore, regulation comes in, I mean, we encourage innovation, we are committed to encourage innovation, especially in fintech, we will be supportive of innovation, we are always supportive of innovation when we have been engaging with, you know, that, uh, that particular ecosystem, the main players in that ecosystem, we are working with, I mean, we do interact with them quite a lot. At the same time, we also try to assess what risks it is building up for uh, the system for the economy and those risks will have to be addressed not by the regulator but the regulator will tell the player himself the players will have to you know the players will have to address uh, those risks and as a regulator it is our responsibility to see that there is no unknown risk build up there is no unbridled unchecked risk risk build up because ultimately the negative consequences and the impact of that will be hugely adverse. So, therefore, it has to be an orderly regulated development. But through your channel, I want to, you know, very clearly say that we would encourage innovation. We are supportive of innovation in fintech. But at the same time, we have to evaluate what kind of risks are coming in, 
what kind of uh, risk buildup is happening and whether they are getting addressed or not. Now, Reserve Bank of India recently, I mean last week, floated a paper about whether the payment gateway UPI, should there be a charge there or not. The government has come up with their own views on that. Do you think an innovative payment gateway like UPI needs to be charged? It's a service. I mean, it's like saying if I was using money order and demand draft, the customer ultimately was paying. You see, we have come out with a discussion paper. Yes. And our, our idea was to get uh, stakeholder comments and suggestions. So let the comments come. We will examine them and uh, move forward. If I could uh, request you to clear the air on RBI stance on PSB privatization. Post circular RBI, RBI did come out with a clarification, but PSB privatization in India, why is that good? You see, as a regulator of the banking sector, we are neutral to ownership. That is the stand of RBI, and that is our, you know, that is the bottom line of our stand. We are ownership neutral. We prescribe certain regulatory guidelines, and it is our job to ensure that those regulatory guidelines are adhered, adhered to, and the banking sector, you, you know, banking sector uh, functions in an orderly manner, in a well-regulated manner. Banks are robust; they are, you know, well capitalized. Their financial parameters should be uh, strong. So we are agnostic to ownership. We are ownership neutral, and uh, uh, in fact. Uh, on the issue of uh, you know this latest thing which you are mentioning, that's a bulletin paper produced by some of our researchers. It does not represent the official view of official view of the RBI, but I think there was some amount of misinterpretation in the market. If you read that sentence uh, carefully, they have said a big bang privatization may do you know may not be as good as following a orderly and calibrated approach as is being done by the government. So the first part of the sentence was cut out yes. and the latter part of the sentence was yes. cut out and only one thing was taken out of context. And uh, so we thought, and since it was being attributed to RBI, we wanted to clarify. We didn't clarify incidentally, our, we just simply said that it's not the official view of the yes. RBI and we only said that the authors, the researchers have only said this, they have not said anything beyond. The official stand of the RBI is that, I am telling you, is that we are ownership neutral. The owners of the bank, it's for them to decide how much of shareholding they want to retain, how much they want to, you know, the others, the public or whoever wants to own. We are, our regulations are, you know, ownership neutral. I'll take the liberty of extending my appointment with just some follow-up questions. According to the regulator, Given that big banks are becoming bigger in India, they have technology, they have brand, they have reach. Small gam banks are not getting marginalized, but they are not growing. Who has the right to win in the financial sector? Who has? The right to win. I think it's the market. I mean, everybody, uh, the small banks have to survive in the market and they have to become more agile. In fact, some of them are quite agile. I mean, uh, let's not uh, uh, think that sometimes uh, two large banks also can uh, develop an amount of inertia. So therefore, uh, size of the bank uh, would matter. I'm not saying it is totally, uh, not, I mean, I'm not saying it's irrelevant. It is relevant, but I think the efficiency of a bank depends not so much on the size. The efficiency of the bank would depend largely on their agility, on their uh, risk assessment, on their, you know, on their, uh, uh, governance, it depends on what kind of governance they have, it depends on what kind of technology leveraging they are doing, it depends on what kind of risk management practices they are following, and what ambitions they have to grow. Governor, you have to deal with extraordinary circumstances, a war, a pandemic, liquidity like never before, inflation like never before, and I've always said that if a pantheon of great governors had to be made, your name would be on the pedestal. But for you, sir, who is your favorite RBI governor? Who has influenced you the most? No, I think there have been, uh, you know, there have been uh, uh, many of them. I mean, it's not fair on my part uh, to sort of uh, comment on my predecessors, or for that matter, when I move out to comment on my successors. I think all of us follow a, you know, that kind of understanding uh, the governor's past, present, and fu future. I think that understanding prevails. It will not be fair on my part 
to do, do that. But I think our, what is more important is RBI as an institution. You see, governors come and go. What is more important is what contribution we are able to make to the institution and how the institution responds to challenges and how the institution is able to maintain financial stability and fulfill whatever is expected of the institution. I would therefore give greater importance to RBI as an institution than uh, governor, individual governors. Do you ever get a Sunday, sir? And I mean that. <laughs> Yes. Just uh, don't take it as yes, a diplomatic yes, no, course, answer no, no. to your uh, <laughs> uh, question. I really mean that. I appreciate that. Uh, is there a Sunday in RBI governor's life? Well, I mean, uh, there, are, I mean there are moments when one has to sort of, uh, you know, take a little bit off. And uh, yes, I mean, it's not... Uh, uh, I think we have, uh, on a serious note, we have an excellent uh, team. And it's a teamwork which uh, sometimes gives me some breathing uh, time to just uh, step back and use that opportunity to you know, put things together and just think about what next to be done. Just to wrap it up, one final question. COVID crisis has been tough for all of us personally, even uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we have all had to take very tough decisions, very radical decisions. When you recall those dark moments of COVID, what was the toughest decision you think you took? When did you get that sleepless night? You got worried. Well, I would not, uh, I would not say that, uh, I mean, I don't have sleepless nights. I get my good <laughs> night's sleep. But when we see some signs of uh, financial instability coming in, and you feel that it can cause uh, a huge uh, impact on the economy. That is the time to, you know, when we have to really, uh, you know, we get greatly concerned. Difficult to say what is the moment because initially when pandemic started, we, everybody thought that it will last for maybe three, four, five, you know, six months, but then it became persistent and uh, very difficult to sort of pinpoint uh, what was that moment. And if there was any one or two points came to my mind, but let me hold it back for a memoir if I ever write it. <laughs> so, well, I, I look forward to that memoir. Governor, thank you so very much for you. accommodating it, this interview request. Thank you for having us over. Thank you. Thank you. Much, and uh, thank you to your uh, viewers also. Namaskar.